On this episode of the Bronze Medalist Podcast, we talk about Anima by Tool. Welcome to another episode of the Bronze Medalist Podcast. I'm Kale. I'm OJ. We're two professional broadcasters, and we like metal. We like mm-hmm. to talk about it. And today we're going to be talking about the uh, album from 1996 titled the, Anima. Their sophomore effort. By Tool, mm-hmm. who are uh, an American uh, progressive metal band, industrial influences in there, uh, mm-hmm. lots of uh, big, huge alternative metal influence as well. Yeah. Um, one of the kind of defining bands of the 90s. Mm-hmm. Uh, for a variety of different reasons, at least for kind of the the weirder side of of alternative metal. Right. Uh, I mean, that was alternative or the 90s was the heyday of that style of music. Right. You're, you're hard pressed to kind of find it now. Yeah. There's some, but there's a lot of things that are influenced by it. But right. s- stuff that just tries to straight up do uh that exact sort of sound uh doesn't really exist in the same way that the you know that you have bands who are trying to do like straightforward death metal or or straightforward like thrash metal these Mm -hmm. days there are plenty of those kinds of bands you don't see a lot of bands you don't see a lot of helmet clones yeah there there are not a lot of bands that have that have uh been formed in the last 15 20 years Mm -hmm. uh that are trying to do this kind of sound uh or or doing a you know a a, a whole ass throwback to mm-hmm. this kind of sound no one's no one's really attempting to do that right this really did exist as you said before we turned on the, the the program thing uh that this is a thing that really only could have existed in the 90s yeah uh and i guess like i don't know what tool sounds like today mm-hmm. i don't know if they have changed significantly or if you know it is a, a very logical evolution of this sound. They also spent a very long time not making any music at all. Right. Uh, because they were developing their new J-pop sound. <laughs> yeah. They were working on Oh, that. that's what it was. Yeah. That's that's why they took such a long hi- hiatus. Re- exactly. Um, but uh, in any case, yeah, this is, this is the sort of music that like uh, all of the different elements uh, put together, I, I feel like are, are something that really could only have existed uh, in in like the mid nineties, right in nineteen ninety six, nineteen the year I was born. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So um, you didn't get this new on the day it came out. I did not. Mm. Uh, neither the vinyl nor CD release. Right, but uh, well, we'll talk more about uh, Anima in a while. Uh, first, how are you? I am fine. I'm doing very well. Thank you. I bought a bookcase again today. You bought another bookcase. Another bookcase because I had uh, I bought the other bookcase and I brought it home and I went. This is not enough bookcase. So I need another bookcase. You didn't have enough bookcase for your books. For my books. And uh, so now I have all my books mainly there. And I, now I have the Wi-Fi on top there. And now I need to get a thing for my Leviathan X so I can mount it on top of my bookcase. There you go. Uh, I have <laughs> the dumb. Th- I-, I had a dumb thought because i have all my copies of uh berserk on yeah. one shelf so i have a burke case <laughs> burke it's my burke case well it, you it's could call burke it shelf. a berserk case but on the internet sometimes to be funny people like to abbreviate as burke burke so it's, it's your burke. burke shelf uh the burke. famous protagonist gus from burke gus from burke um but uh yeah <laughs> do you now have enough book case for your books uh, if I buy any, if I buy another book, you will no longer have enough. I will no longer case. have enough. You book have case. just enough bookcase. Yeah, and I still have a couple of shelves that are that are double, double stacked, double stacked. Right. Okay. Like if I want to find a certain uh, 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 fantasy series that I have, I have to remove the books from the front of the shelf to get to the ones in the back. You got a whole library. I got a library. You got a, li- a library. A library. I love books. You love. I love books. <laughs> I don't know. It's just like Broden Kelly saying that popped into my mind <laughs> yeah. from uh, from Auntie Donna. I don't know. It's just Broden's all of books. Uh, I don't know why. 
<laughs> did, did you ever watch there was this is <clears throat> such a specific uh <clears throat> thing that came from a corner of the internet that i don't know how many people visited it's this weird uh it's a 3d animated creature from some sort of 90s or 2000s like weirdo animated thing okay uh called the glub glow glab glob or some shit like it's this weird like lumpy worm man who lives in like a library and he sings this little song uh and it became like it, it went like viral on the someone had it on a vhs tape or a cd or something I think it was like an educate a weird like educational point and click CD game. Sure. Um and, and this disgusting creature singing its song mm-hmm. uh went <laughs> viral and so that's what popped into my head you talking about all your books. Uh uh even though you're not a weird combination of an earthworm and the Michelin man. No, I am. You are? Yeah, that's oh, exactly okay. what I look like. If if you've never seen me out there Picture that <laughs> a combination like a centaur, uh-huh. a centaur. But the the human part is the mich- is a flesh colored Michelin man. Uh-huh. And the uh, the horse part is a giant earthworm. Right. Uh, that's, that's exactly me. what OJ looks mm-hmm. like. Absolutely no hair whatsoever. None. Completely hairless. And always covered in a thin layer of slime. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a mucus. mucus. It's uh, it is. Yes. Yeah. You're like a hagfish. Right. You know, you know my my biggest enemy is salt. I can't. Yeah, it's it's like uh, there was a time where I brought in some chips mm-hmm. and I offered one to you. And, and, I, and uh, I hissed and slithered away. Yeah, you. Uh. it was uh, uh, very mm. frightening because you opened up your mouth and I could see that you have you have like a lamprey right. mouth in there where it's just a ring of teeth mm-hmm. uh, in several layers sort of going back. Right. Uh, it was like gazing into the mouth of, of Moadib. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my uh, yeah, my my uh, my jaw area. I have four. It's like a uh, four, a quad jaw. It's not like just a, a, a. You're like a predator. Yeah. Uh, 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 and I, after you slithered away, I was like, "That's one ugly motherfucker." <laughs> uh, motherfucker. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> anything else you've been up to other than getting some bookcases? Uh I've been having a lot of fun lately. Um, I told you I got an air fryer, right? I, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm <laughs> sorry just going like I've been having a lot of fun lately and following that up with so I got an air fryer <laughs> yeah mm, that's right I'm a crazy Mildly. man <laughs> watch out everybody <laughs> the fun is happening at my this house this guy's going nuts <laughs> <laughs> living life to the fullest exactly. over here <laughs> um, you, uh, what have you been making with your air fryer well I've been making I got some chicken that I made in there okay. and then I got some other different kind of chicken uh-huh. That uh-huh. I made in there, and some different kind of potatoes that I put in there with some chicken, and it was pretty good. That sounds pretty good. Mm-mm. It's pretty nice. And I soused it up. You sou what kind of sauce? Uh, I have a, a spicy <laughs> barbecue. And <laughs> why are you from Georgia? I don't, I have no, well, I don't know. I don't know. No idea. Uh, I lived there for a while. Yeah. So maybe maybe it just subconsciously right. has stayed in your brain. Um, yeah. I. Uh, I, 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 the, the sort of mundanity of being like, I got an air fryer. I'm really excited about uh-huh. <laughs> reminded me I I've continued watching, uh, Joe Para mm-hmm. stuff oh, yeah. content. Uh, I've watched all of all, all three seasons of his television show, sure. uh, which is available on HBO max, by the way, if you have HBO max, uh, I would highly recommend watching them. They're very short bite-sized episodes and 11 weird. minutes each <laughs> they're weird but very charming and uh uh like gentle and soft uh and funny with just the driest possible humor um it's just uh it's it's really uh-huh. uh pleasant right? right i would describe it as bizarre but pleasant like there's a lot of other shows on Adult Swim that are incredibly bizarre and kind of like funny, but in a horrifying sort of way mm-hmm. of just like, what the fuck am I even watching? What is this shit? But this thing, this is just like, what is this? This makes me smile. I, I, I like imagine this. if you called Mrs. Borner and said, how do you describe your son? She'd say bizarre, but pleasant. Bizarre. <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> I'll take like like, the you know. 
for me going through life, I would very much prefer for people to think of me as weird but nice mm-hmm. than uh normal but an asshole. Right. I I will I'll I'll take weird and nice over over normal dickhead any day. I feel like the word asshole fits into the word normal as far as, you know, describing humans these days anyway. I think I feel yes. like that's you know your regular person now just just less, seems like an asshole. Pleasant. Yeah. Which Tara I was looking over here uh the God of War Ragnarok. You, uh-huh. you haven't finished that yet, have you? No, I haven't. Okay. I've I'm I the way that I play video games. Mm-hmm is i i i do i especially like games that have any kind you know any kind of open world uh element to them Mm -hmm. where you have optional content that you can go and do even if i know oh i can go and do this optional content after the story Mm -hmm. the main story is concluded i don't want to do that i want to do all the optional stuff before I finished that main story. You know, and it's uh, I I agree to some extent on that, uh, but a lot of times, especially with games that are only sort of kind of open world, like like the God of War, mm-hmm. uh, I find that if you do all the optional content and then you upgrade all the shit and get all the uh, best weapons and armor and everything, then you get to that last part of the game. Mm-hmm. It's like I feel like I'm cheesing it now. Good. <laughs> I'm playing motherfucking Kratos. True. I want a power trip. Also, I'm not very good at this game. <laughs> so uh, any kind of edge uh-huh. I feel like is appropriate. All right. Like, like I'm not playing fucking Dark Souls. I'm not doing this for the challenge. <laughs> I'm I'm do I'm doing this because I want to see this beautiful story of this haunted man and his boy. Mm-hmm. I, I I don't want to, you know, I'm not there. Uh, like I want it to be mildly challenging, which is why I played it on the middle. The middle difficulty. Sure. I played give me it on, a story. Give me balance. Oh, give me balance. Right. Uh, no, give me a story is the weakest one. Yeah. I. I. You know. I. I still want it to be mildly challenging, but mm-hmm. I also am not a, a glutton for punishment because I don't. I don't have like the reflexes for uh, really excelling in combat as high as fast paced as what you have in god of war sure uh whereas like in, you know there's only one difficulty in in from soft games right they're hard yeah there's only one difficulty and you either get used to it or you stop playing the game <laughs> um uh-huh. and uh those games also are generally a lot slower paced right uh when it comes to combat than you know enemies telegraph their movements quite a bit more mm-hmm. um and I, I like whenever i'm struggling with a boss in god of war ragnarok mm-hmm. it takes me a long time to like to to get into like from soft mode of like all right stop trying to do a billion things at once uh-huh. just take it slow like stop trying to do a billion damage uh, as quickly as possible mm. and, uh, you, uh, you know, take it slow and react to what's going on. Right. Dodge, instead dodge, of dodge. just, you mm-hmm. know, slashing as, as fast as humanly possible. Because I see other people who play, who like really excel at uh-huh. that kind of gameplay and they're going absolutely batshit insane. Uh, and that's how I feel like I have to play. But it's like, no, just play like, if you're really struggling, like just play it like it's like it's Elden Ring, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and and actually learn the the patterns. Although that doesn't work quite as well because there are a lot of enemies where their attacks are way are much 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 less telegraphed mm-hmm. than what you have in a FromSoft game. Right, but the the good thing about this, well, I guess the 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 sort of a cheat in there is that it gives you the uh, the yellow or red circle. Yeah, for some of them. Yeah. Only for like only for like the, you know, attacks that are going to stun you when they hit you. Mm-hmm. There are some regular attacks that they don't give you like any little blip for at all that are ones that you could parry if you knew they were coming, <laughs> if you had any idea they were about to have like the specifically the ones that get me a lot are the Drekki, the the uh, sure. crocodile like dragon creatures. Right. Uh, those things have like a bunch of lightning fast regular attacks mm-hmm. that don't have, you know, any sort of indicator that they're about to happen. 
and you have no way of knowing whether it's going to be a bite or a tail whip or it's going to shoot some lightning at you or something mm-hmm. like it could be any one of those things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's also that like the timing for uh, is because Kratos's shield isn't always out. Right. Uh, you have to be proactive about that. Because it takes a half second for the shield to deploy because mm-hmm. it, you know, it fans out from a little arm right. bracer that he's wearing. So it takes a little bit for it to pop out to get it where, like, again, I'm in from soft mode where parrying in those games is something that you do either with like a, uh, I think sometimes you can technically parry with with just uh just your hand Mm -hmm. but most of the time it's you have like a dagger that has a a particular thing on it that you can use to parry or you have a shield shield. right um and that's something that you always have equipped Mm -hmm. uh and so when you go to parry it happens instantly uh Mm -hmm. if you know to go and and do it with Mm -hmm. the timing window on parries and from soft games or is also much much more punishing Mm-hmm. Uh, as far as like how much time you have to actually get the parry off. I'm terrible at parrying in FromSoft. Uh, I, for the first like four hours that I played Dark Souls 1, mm-hmm. uh, was actually like surprisingly good at it. And then I uh, did not continue to develop that skill. Um, Because I also eventually found like shortly after that, I found the Halberd. Oh, sure. Uh, I, I think... First, I found the Claymore, and then I found the Halberd, and from then on, I used pretty much exclusively two-handed weapons throughout the entirety of the the rest of my time playing Dark Souls. Right. And then in Elden Ring, I pretty much exclusively used, like, either two-handing a sword or having sword in one hand in, like, uh, you know, a, a, a spellcasting mm-hmm. focus, whatever the fuck they were called in, in Elden Ring. I don't remember. Um, but you know, sword in one hand, spell thing in the other. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't remember what they were. That's how I played Skyrim. Yeah. I don't remember what the spell <laughs> things were called in, in, um, Elden Ring in, in Dark Souls one and probably three. Cause I, I, you didn't play fucking, two fucking no. Well, yeah, fucking nobody, uh, uses, okay. Not nobody. Hardly anybody uses like, uh, uh, um, sorceries in, Dark Souls one and two. Yeah. Uh, or one and one and three, I guess. I don't know about two, but like if people use any magic at all, they're using like the holy magic or they're using mm-hmm. uh, uh, pyromancies, which are kind of rely on the same sort of uh, stats. Um, but they're called, I think the things you use to cast spells in there are called catalysts. Mm-hmm. I, I don't remember what they're called in, in Elden Ring. I just had, I had a staff throughout the, sure. uh, I can't remember. You remember which one? I think it was just I think it was just called a staff. Honestly, it, it was I, I used the I think the carrion um, mm. like the carrion. Fuck, I don't remember. The carrion, it's been, yeah, it's, it's a carrion something carrion mm-hmm. scholar or something like that. Uh, Academy staff, maybe. Um, but anyway, that's that's the one that I used for the longest time. It's been, it's been like a year since I've played Elden Ring. Uh, I, I kind of, I kind of miss it. Uh-huh. Um, I don't know when that DLC is coming out, but I'll, we'll be playing it again sure. when, when it does. So you play but, it, uh, the game all the way through or are you just, yeah, yeah. I'm going to play the game all the way through again. Um, although like a lot of people say it kind of doesn't have <clears throat> nearly as much replay value as some of the other, uh, from soft titles because there's so much like open world, like a lot of open world games, people say don't really have a lot of replay value mm-hmm. because so much of the so much of what's great about open world games is the is the exploration. Mm-hmm. And when you go back and replay, it's like, you know where everything's at. Yeah, I've already been here. None of this is new. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're never going to if you play Skyrim again, you're ne- never going to have that sense of wonder that you had when you walk out of the cave for the first time right. and, and see, you know, uh, 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 river wood down, you know, down the valley and then, Oh, there's bleak falls barrow up on the other side right. as, as Alduin kind of flies overhead. It's like, it's like, uh, you're never going to have that moment again. Cause the second you walk out of there, you're like, 
All right. Uh, I got, I'm on a strict schedule. I got to, you know, go and craft 8,000 iron daggers uh, <laughs> get my as smithing. quickly as yeah. possible. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, uh-huh. you don't get any of that, really. And so in Elden Ring, like, a lot of that exploration and discovery uh, is gone on a, a second playthrough. Because you by that time, you also, you know how small the map really is in in actual practice like Mm -hmm. it's a pretty big open world map but you get torrent right away right and uh you can you can effectively go pretty much everywhere on the entire map right away Mm -hmm. with the exceptions being you know they make it more difficult for you to get up to alta's plateau uh whether you go up make it more difficult I don't know what the fuck you did that you you tell me you got up there without doing something special. You, you just you just have to get the two halves of the medallion. That's all you have to How do. How did you get the two halves of the medallion? You just have to go uh you have to go behind the big dragon. Uh you know what I'm talking about? What the hell is the name of that uh, there's a manor and there's half the medallion up at the top of that. The a ladder you have to go up a ladder and you have to fight those fucking bat things. Okay, that's still making it more difficult than just being able to go there, though. You see what I'm saying? What do you mean? There, well, because you, you can't just walk up to the platform and go straight up there. You have to go and get some stuff first. Yeah, but uh, and, and they don't just give it to you. No, they don't. Yeah, you have to go. You have to go through. You have to. I mean, sure, you got to fight things everywhere you go in the game. Uh, <clears throat> what, what he's referring to is the fact that I didn't do my first boss fight until I got to the Draconic Tree Spear, uh, Tree Sentinel. I, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, for some reason it's blowing his mind I just I, I cannot imagine playing the game that way <laughs> it, it's batshit insane to me that you mm-hmm. can skip over like the entire like intended path of the game like that uh-huh. I, I just don't get it then I went back and did it yeah because I yeah, the other one okay so one yeah one is at Fort Height which yeah. is right in the starting area but the other is at Fort Faroth which Fort- is on the in entire opposite end of Kalid, which is a gigantic nightmare zone so it is you don't get to just you don't get to just go immediately up there you have to do some work for it well yeah you can sprint past everything of course but that Mm -hmm. feeds into what i'm saying Mm -hmm. about how like if you know to go and get those things right then it isn't really like that much of a challenge Right. Uh, uh, but like, I was trying to play it differently. That's what I was just trying to play differently. I want to see what happens unlike if Unlike your play first it this way. playthrough, though. That's something you do on, like, your third or your fourth. <laughs> like, I feel like the first playthrough, you should play it the way the developers intend. Because I just, I just felt like what I, wasn't, what I was doing wasn't working. So I figured I need to do it a different way. <sighs> I don't get it. I don't get it. It's fine. Well, I'll play, I'll call whatever play style you have is valid. I don't get it. <laughs> I don't get it. The tree, sp- uh, tree sentinel took me a long fucking time to beat. Well, yeah, because you hadn't fought any other fucking bosses. Well, yeah, that's true. Go and fight fucking Margit first. <laughs> the fuck? Uh, I don't get it. Anyway, fucking. Or the I regular remember, tree sentinel. I don't remember what I was trying to say before you made me so terribly angry. <laughs> I can't believe you've done this. I, oh fuck! I can't believe you've done this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, something about open world games not having replay value in that way because the exploration is a mm-hmm. part of it, mm-hmm. and they tend not to have like big action set pieces the way that though you know you play a game that's a bit more on rails. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have, you know, these big cinematic action set pieces right. that you don't get in games like Skyrim because uh, Bethesda is extremely fucking lazy right? Um, and is working with a game engine that makes it physically impossible for them to do that sort of thing and have it look at all good. <laughs> the few amount of times that like Bethesda attempts to do those sorts of things with that game engine uh, almost always feel incredibly awkward and fall right on their face. <laughs> uh, anytime they like take control away from you to have like something happen on screen, mm-hmm. it just looks so uh, stilted and awkward. Mm-hmm. Um uh, but that game's from 2011. Yeah, but so is like uh, 
so is like spec ops the line and sure. and like uh uh call of duty modern warfare 3 uh like these these other games that like like modern warfare 3 that was running on like id tech 2 or some shit like really? like infinity ward didn't start like i think i think like call of duty developers whether it was infinity ward or treyarch Mm -hmm. uh kept using like the same engine that doom 3 ran on from 2004 Uh uh uh, whatever version of id tech that was they continued to use that until pretty fucking recently i think (laughs) which is insane to me i don't Mm -hmm. know what they use now i think they might have switched to unreal engine but i'm not i'm not entirely sure but uh uh like like there are plenty of other games that came out in 2011 that were perfectly capable of of delivering that sort of thing it's also not necessarily it's not what people expect from a bethesda sort of game right but um like your fallout uh, yeah like you know i'm i'm fine with that sort of and also like uh you contrast that with like fallout new vegas or whatever mm. uh it's this is like it's such a such a trope of any time people talk about bethesda games to immediately be like oh, but here's fallout new vegas over here mm-hmm. um uh <laughs> and but they're right because it's such a good game that understands how to use its extremely old technology mm-hmm. uh you know mm. uh uh I wanted to say Black Isle. That's not that's not what it was. That's a uh, Obsidian. Mm. Um, Black Isle is the company that Obsidian was formed out of after it collapsed. But like Bethesda was like, hey, Obsidian, you guys are a lot of the same people that made the first two Fallout games. Do you want to make a Fallout game? Uh, here's this incredibly shitty engine we've been using since <laughs> Morrowind. Here you go. Good luck. Make a Fallout game out of this mm-hmm. in a year. Um, wow. And they knocked it out of the park. But part of the reason for that is they, you know, kind of ha- were forced to work in those limitations and only had that amount of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, Obsidian has this weird sort of thing where when they aren't given ridiculous limitations, their games aren't as good. Really? Like, uh, I never finished The Outer Worlds, uh, which, like, had a lot of the same sort of elements that I really liked about Fallout New Vegas. Mm-hmm. And I just kind of went, eh. So it's like they've got some sort of option paralysis. A little bit, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's like, uh, and it's the gameplay loop uh, is relatively tight but things just felt a little bit less inspired in a lot of like uh uh, it played pretty well it's just that like some of the story elements felt a little flat um Mm -hmm. uh i don't know it was it was fun for for what it was while i played it but i i just never went back and never went back and finished it for some reason and i don't really feel any particular desire to and that seems to be a sentiment that a lot of people sort of share Mm -hmm. that it was just kind of like ah okay uh do you want to talk about Tool? Sure. So Tool, as uh, we mentioned, is an American. Uh, at this point, you could call them a rock band, I guess. Uh, that's what Wikipedia likes to do. But uh, uh, they're really their bread and butter, I think, is fair to call it progressive metal. Mm-hmm. Uh, but with a, you know, obviously a massive, massive dose of alternative uh, metal and alternative rock in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, industrial lots of elements. Yeah. Industrial elements, avant-garde elements, mm-hmm. uh, all kind of coalescing into the sound of like the definitive sound of of 90s metal, I mm-hmm. think. Uh, you know, a, a band that, I mean, was formed in the late 80s. Sure. But uh, really came it to its own in the 90s with their first two albums uh, and sort of established themselves as, as uh, you know, one of the one of the leading acts uh, is in the, you know, alternative metal and, and progressive metal scene. Right. Uh, Tool is weird because it's one of those bands that like, I have a lot of friends who don't really listen to metal or have like, you know, whatever metal they have listened to is mm-hmm. kind of limited to what was on the radio when we were kids. And right. so, you know, the, it, it's it's kind of limited to like new metal and or, or, you know, very extremely popular bands like Metallica and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But I, I have multiple friends 
who have listened to and really enjoy Tool, which I think is such a bizarre sort of thing when you consider <laughs> what Tool is right. and how fucking weird they are. Like people who are making this kind of like like progressive avant-garde music these days don't get anywhere near as popular as Tool did. Right. It, it, it's weird to see how wide uh, the like tools fan base is and how big their appeal seems to have been that th- they have so many fans from so many different walks of life and people who aren't really like metal fans, but have listened to and enjoyed a tool. That's uh, think, weird to me. I think the reason for that is what the word avant garde means, it means the thing that's out front. This was out front in 1996. This is this is digging new ground. This yeah. Is, this is this, if anything's trying to do this now. It's like, what are you doing? This debuted on at, at number what what number two something on like Billboard that. Top 200 yeah. or something like that. Like like this was a big fucking deal, right? Uh, but this wouldn't be groundbreaking now because this already exists. Exactly. But it's also like I think such we're talking about how they're kind of you know. A, a product of their time has weird connotations when you say it right. these days. But like, you know, uh, even if this stuff was new and groundbreaking in the nineties, it is still weird that this also was as popular as it was in the nineties. And I think it's again, like mm-hmm. it could only have happened then. Right. Um, uh, like e- even today, the, you know, the most like groundbreaking and weird bands that are, making new stuff mm-hmm. that is weird and, and avant-garde they're not you know doing fucking uh uh you know massive numbers on the billboard charts or anything like right. that you know they're you know deep underground shit that weirdos like us only know about i, and I think a lot of that has to do with the internet yeah there's yeah. there's so much stuff available right um and there are so many you know Anybody who's making any kind of weird thing can make, you know, put together a, a, a reasonably competent sounding album and, mm-hmm. and put it out there. So I guess there's there's a lot more stuff available for people to listen to. But it's yeah, I don't know. It's something that I've always thought of as weird of like you can it, it's not unreasonable to expect the type of person who has a tap out sticker on the back window yeah. of their pickup truck. Uh huh. To also maybe have a tool sticker. Sure. It's weird that there's that kind of crossover to me. Um, And they're like the only band I can think of that has that kind of crossover. That is this type of band. Right. Um, Because there are those bands. Oh, yeah. There there are those bands. (laughs) Yeah. You know, fucking Five Finger Death Punch and Korn and Mm -hmm. and, uh, a whole bunch of other, you know, those types of bands definitely have uh, appeal to that type of that type of person. Mm -hmm. But um uh tool is just a a a kind of a weird a weird i I think part of it maybe also is their personality and presentation as a band i mean like part of their logo is the the wrench with the the cock the cock and balls wrench right yeah uh there's you know that sort of alternative rock element i think to them is very much the sort of uh uh irreverence Mm -hmm. in, in the uh uh parody i guess we were talking before we started recording about how at least from the point of view of of maynard james keenan who is infamously a pretentious asshole (laughs) the lead singer of the band by the way if you don't know uh uh he like so many of the lyrics are like part at least partially satirical Mm -hmm. it's kind of i mean it's that 90s mix of like satirical but also i'm gonna get real deep into my emotions sometimes and say some real personal shit and then i'm gonna but i'm gonna say this real personal shit in kind of a twisted sort of way (laughs) um right (laughs) it sounds like really reductive but i think it gets the point across yeah um but like you know the things that are being satirized are being lampooned upon but the manner in which they're being satirized is taken very self-seriously yeah is sort of the vibe um, but, uh, uh, so yeah, the, the members of the band, uh, vocalist and lyricists, Mater James Keenan, uh, then guitars provided by Adam Jones, mm-hmm. uh, Justin Chancellor played bass on this and has continued to play bass. Uh, he was one of the first album. He was not on their first right. album. Uh, uh, otherwise the lineup has remained the same since this album came out, which I think is impressive for a band that's 
been around as long as Tula has. But again, right. oh, there was also a pretty massive hiatus right. there in the middle. Yeah, they put out, what, four albums? Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> uh, drums provided by Danny Carey. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, they had a pretty massive hiatus uh, after, let's see, what album was the last one before the the one they put out a couple of years ago? Uh, Not, what was that for Lateralis? It? it was 10,000 Days, I think. Okay. Was their, I just want to make sure. Their... Their, yeah, 10,000 Days came out in 2006, and then they did not make another album until 2019. Right. Uh, and have, I, I think they're, they have continued to perform and are probably going to make more music. I don't know. I, I guess I, I'm not super tuned in <laughs> to uh, what Tool is, what Tool is up to. I forgot about 10,000 Days. Uh, I, I heard a lot of people say that their newest album is kind of like, unimpressive in the sense that it's like uh uh just kind of picks up where they left off and mm-hmm. you don't really feel uh, 15 that there could have been 15 years of development that happened that it's just like oh more it's, tool right more more tool music i mean but it, it seems like when you do that though the world passes you by and has moved yeah. on and and if you're doing the same thing you know in in a different mold yeah Maybe it's not going to fit as well. well. It's like they all kept making music, you know, themselves in that hiatus. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Maynard had a perfect circle and, right. and I don't know what everyone else was up to necessarily. But like they theoretically all could have developed as musicians more in, in that hiatus and maybe have come out with it's like, oh, this is something this this is a little different than what it's going to say. And at least what I heard was like, oh, it's just kind of more uh, more more, tool, more yeah. what it was. That's OK. Yeah. Uh, but people weren't like, you know, going gangbusters over it, um, which I don't know. Vaguely interesting. Uh, wh- what's your uh, sort of history with Tool? You you mentioned a little bit of it. Yeah, uh, um, I, uh, I I actually got their first full length album, Undertow. I had that on CD. I also had Opiate, the initial EP they released. OK, uh, I, I had those, but I only kind of got those because. We were going to Lollapalooza '93, yeah, and and it, these guys are gonna be like, this is fucking awesome. You need to listen to this. And so yep. we did. And we're like, yeah, we really like this. Pretty good. It's very good. And then we saw them at the Target Center there in uh, in Minneapolis. Mm-hmm. Of course, we also saw you know Rage Against the Machine, yeah, Pr- Primus, Alice in Chains. That, that's a, a pretty banger lineup. Right it was, there. Well, yeah, it was a very banging lineup. Uh, yeah, plus a lot of bands I'm sure you've never heard of. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, probably. I mean, Lollapalooza in the '90s, right? Yeah, thirty um, years ago. Uh, uh, well, and you because you mentioned Rage Against the Machine and mm-hmm. Tom Morello, uh, high school friends with uh, Adam uh, Jones. Adam Jones. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had mentioned how like there's a weird sort of timeline in my head where that I thought that was odd. Mm-hmm. Like I think of for some reason Rage Against in my head, Rage Against the Machine has been around for a lot longer than they have. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they only, they formed in 1991. Right. Uh, which is after, you know, two years after Tool got together. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know why I thought, uh, why I thought that was weird, but uh, it was Tom Morello who was like, hey, you guys should have Tool perform uh, at Lollapalooza. Right. Uh, and it was a good, a good choice. It was a good choice. Very good choice. It was, it, it was an intense, intense moment because as they played second stage, they were outside mm-hmm. and uh, there was this big wall of cops just looking down at the crowd and on the stage Maynard, I don't know how he was doing this, but he was just staring at me the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> it just, stared, and so I was like, Ugh. so when the joint got passed in front of my face, I'm like, what? I better smoke this. And then I did a little big wall of cops and I'm hitting this joint and passing it on. And just Maynard just got more intense after that, just staring at me. Somehow, somehow he was only looking at you the entire time. The entire the, time. The drugs had nothing to do with I'm it. I'm sure not. <laughs> nothing to do with the drugs. Yeah. Um, I feel like if you're a cop providing security at Lollapalooza, right? You gotta have you, you gotta just be chill. What are you gonna do? Arrest everybody for having a joint? Like, because everybody does. Yeah. Like what? <laughs> what the fuck are you gonna do? Yeah. Like like you're not gonna go through that cr- that throng of people to find that one person you see smoking a joint. Like no, you don't have time for that shit. Right. Uh. Um. 
Uh, sorry. You keep on hitting your microphone. I'm sorry. Unprofessional. I'm, dr- I'm drinking a Coke. Uh, he brought a, fi- a McDonald's fish sandwich. Yeah, you know, because I went to the drive through and I, I gave myself enough time to do so to get a sa- to get a sandwich and a Coke. And then I had to wait around the corner for a long meet a lot of other people. I don't yeah. know if they just didn't have their shit together tonight. What was going on inside there? But I sat there for quite a while. Which McDonald's you go to? One of Over the here at the mall. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I end up having to wait around the corner a lot at that McDonald's. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I don't know exactly what the deal is, but uh, they're yeah. they're a little slower. I, I go I the the one on thirty uh, first and Broadway is probably uh-huh. closer. <laughs> yeah, but I go to the one at the mall because you can avoid Broadway that way. Yeah, I don't have to go across Broadway. Not that it's a huge deal because it's just right. waiting at the light. <laughs> but that's also the thing is waiting at the light. You never really know. <laughs> I, I I love it when we when we dip into my not talk extremely <laughs> extreme narrow casting. Okay, there are two McDonald's uh-huh. within you know uh, a half mile of my apartment. Right. Uh, They're not next to each other. They're in opposite directions. In opposite directions. Uh-huh. Uh, one is along the you know the highway, the main thoroughfare through the city, uh-huh. uh, and the other is by the mall. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was deemed that that was, you know, far enough apart and near enough to two major, uh, draws Mm -hmm. that you could have a McDonald's in each location and they would not compete with each other. The the one on, uh, on Broadway is between, uh, Home Depot and Menards. I'm trying to remember, see, Menards is a thing that everyone across the Midwest can, uh, yeah. And, and if, if we have any target audience, I hope it's our fellow Midwesterners. Yeah. Uh, well, our fellow Midwesterners who frequently save big money at, at Menards. Menards, exactly. See, that's the thing. I think, I think, because uh, people are always, you know, I think people f- who are from further east uh-huh. than North Dakota tend not to think of North Dakota as being Midwestern. I say, if you live in a place that has Menards, that's the Midwest, baby. Sure. I mean, they think they, techni- technically we're in the plains. Technically, but call it's it's the mid the Midwest is not a geographic location. The Midwest is a vernacular uh, region. It has nothing to do with ge- with like geography or geology. I learned it's, this it's in a college. Thing. It's a cultural thing. It is not. It doesn't have anything to do with the land itself. It has to do with the people that live on the land. Mm-hmm. Although I've heard a lot of people argue that you have to go east of the Red River. To be in the Midwest. Bullshit. Fargo's on uh, this side of the Red River. And if Fargo is not in the Midwest, what the fuck are you smoking? <laughs> Fargo is so uh-huh. Midwest, uh-huh. they uh, are alone and it takes them 40 minutes to leave their house just talking to themselves right. and saying goodbye. The Midwestern goodbye. The opposite of the Irish goodbye. There are no other people around, and it still takes them 40 minutes to get out of the door. Yeah, Uh, That's how Midwestern Fargo is. Uh, Fargo is so Midwestern, uh, uh, a couple of movie-making brothers decided that they wanted to somehow make a murder mystery and lampoon the Midwest, decided to pick that town. As the name of the movie, even though most of the movie takes place in uh, Brainerd. Yeah, Brainerd. Which actually is pretty goddamn far into Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I always, for whatever reason, in my head thought Brainerd would have been closer to Fargo. No. It's pretty goddamn far away from Fargo. Yeah, uh, it's across anyway. the state. Yeah, it's 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 up north, isn't it? Is it up north? It's like most of the ways to Duluth, I yeah. think. <laughs> uh, okay, is... you, you pronounced that wrong, by the way. That's so mo- most, most of the way to, of the way to Duluth. Don't you know? Don't you know? Oh, <laughs> gosh. Okay. All right. Let's stop talking cool. about the Midwest. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we were way too in sync on that. Yeah, I know. Uh, <clears throat> so, tools. <laughs> Uh, if you're wondering about the title, by the way, uh-huh. uh, it is a fusion of the uh, Latin word anima mm-hmm. or uh, animus, right. uh, which is it refers to like the soul. Yeah. Uh, and also anima, you know, when you wash out your butthole. Yeah. Uh, that <laughs> uh, It's exactly what you think it might be. Uh, right. Yeah. It's an anima. Yeah. Which I think is also very. Uh, uh, um indicative of 
tools, dual sensibilities as a band. Right. Where you have this like sort of uh, tendency towards like very deep conceptual things like with lateralis, all the shit about the Fibonacci sequence and all that shit, uh-huh. like these su- uber pretentious concepts for this music. Mm-hmm. And then you have uh, song titles like stink fist. Right. Well, that's on this yeah. hooker with a penis. Also on this. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> like, uh, you know, yeah. you, the, the fusion of those two sides of tool <laughs> and the entire song, a letter to Mr. Manbeck. <laughs> I don't remember exactly what that one. That's just, was. that's it's just a, an answering machine message from an Italian dude. Oh yeah, <laughs> so you think you're super cool? Don't Fuck you! you. <laughs> Fuck you! Fucking American! Yeah. Uh, there is also, of course, the Eye of on Satan. Yeah. Uh, which, if you uh, are wondering, well, what's that? That's German, and they mention Satan. Uh, uh, that means uh, the devil's eggs. Um, right. And it's uh, a man. Uh, Yelling passionately in German out to a crowd, um, which has is very you know evocative audio. Mm-hmm. Uh, what he's reading uh, out loud in German is a recipe for a Mexican wedding cookie. Mm-hmm. Um, like it's it's <laughs> such a weirdly multi layered joke. Uh, there, I think there's a little bit more to it than that about something to do with the recipe, but like y- yeah, it's it's mm-hmm. it's a weirdly multi layered joke. Um, there's a lot of like weird sort of jokes. Like like we said, there's a lot of like satirical sort yeah. of elements. A lot here. of weird shit in here. A lot of weird shit. Um uh let, let's get to our our criteria uh that which we use to rate okay. albums. Okay, okay. Uh which we which I I never like call that out. We just go straight in it's like does it slap? <laughs> it's like Yeah. This is kind of our weird little rating system. Does it slap? Uh yeah. This, yeah, yeah, I'd say this album slapped for mm-hmm. sure. Uh, so I was looking at uh, uh, the reviews available on Wikipedia. Mm-hmm. Out of 11 reviews, it came out to about a 76.5, which really? I think is a little low. Part of that, though, is there are a couple of like, because this album was such a big hit, mm-hmm. there are a couple of reviews on there from very big publications that you would go like, oh, well, of course they gave it a five out of 10 mm-hmm. because these aren't people who get it. Right. This music isn't for them. Mm -hmm. Um, So, of course, they didn't like it very much. Uh, So there are a couple of of (laughs) low outliers from publications like that. They'll be like my mom reviewing it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, A a lot of other publications, uh, much, much more highly rated. Um, Sputnik, I don't know if this was at the time, because I think Sputnik music's been around for a while. Yeah. But uh, uh, I don't think 1996 there. I think. Probably not. But uh, so I don't know when this review was done 100 mm-hmm. percent on Sputnik. Wow. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, 76.5 uh, average of, of 11 reviews. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's your favorite song on this album? Um, I really like the the title song because anima yeah uh because you know i i really wish the bomb would wash it all away soon yeah it's a, it's a very uh dour yeah. sort of song i too am sick of this bullshit <laughs> free reign circus sideshow um i also uh, man what is well stink fist is a great song yep 46 and 2 it's 46 and 2 is my favorite yeah um i i, I think part of it Part of why I like 46 and two is mm-hmm. that it's a it's a a bit God, it seems at least I wasn't paying super close attention to the lyrics. It seems to have a bit less of that sort of tongue in cheek kind of humor that at least to me feels like some of it hasn't aged super well. <laughs> like like some of the lyrics feel mm-hmm. a little uh, a little um, immature in, in some ways. Sure. Uh, 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 but part, that's kind of part of the point and part of the style. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that's just that's just what that's what you did in alternative metal. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but which, so. which, is, which is kind of uh, also kind of odd because Maynard was in his 30s at the time. Really? He's older than I think he is. Yeah, know? he'll be 60 this year. Uh, but in, in any case, uh, I, I liked it because it was I, I, also, I just like the. The vibe of it is really good. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a bit more of a low key vibe for much of it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, uh, I forty six and two. I I don't know. I mean, that's forty eight. I, <laughs> I don't know what the significance of that is. Like, I wasn't paying like super close attention to the lyrics. So I don't mm-hmm. know if it's if there's somebody out there going like, "Oh, it means this." You weren't paying attention to the song. I think it's a. Uh, it might be a reference to genetics. 
Okay. For like chromosomes yeah. or okay. Uh because yeah, like a lot of the other songs, I was reading through like the Wikipedia page, a lot of the other songs had like, you know, uh, meaning sort of like uh, inspirations behind them or meanings explained a little bit. And that mm-hmm. that one was was omitted, I think, partially because it is one of seemingly one of the more like uh, less funny sort of songs. Right. Sure. Uh, and less, less satirical. And and I think what he's getting at with that title is sort of a bit politically incorrect at this point. Anyway. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. It's a good, it's a good song. Right. I don't, yeah. Now that you say that perhaps, but uh, mm-hmm. I don't know. The vibe was good. Now the vibe might be off. <laughs> that was a real vibe check. <laughs> yeah, sorry about people that. People still saying that? Are people still saying vibe check? Is that a thing? I don't know. Oh, I thought you were... I'm not in touch with the youth. <laughs> yeah. Uh, You're not, I'm not in touch with the youth. As as we discussed on Sunday, I'm I'm uh, either the oldest Zoomer or the youngest millennial. Right. I, You're you right there at the cusp. I, I prefer to think of myself as the youngest millennial. That's <clears throat> mostly because I have all older siblings. Uh, sure. Sure. And I think you really tend towards if you have older siblings, you have <clears throat> tend to have more in common with them culturally than you do with people who are around your age or younger, because hmm. that that's the stuff you grew up with. Maybe I'm a millennial. Maybe you're a millennial. Because <laughs> all my little brothers and sisters are millennials. Maybe. Could be. I don't know. Uh, cause like for me, like I, you know, the movies that we had when I was real little were all the movies that my sister grew up watching. So sure. I grew up watching, you know, early nineties, Disney movies and that sort of thing. See, I, and I, uh, grew up making quote fingers, uh, watching those same movies Yeah, from, from the eighties when I actually, when I was a kid, of course we didn't have a VHS yeah. player, but once you got the VHS player, uh, you had younger siblings that probably wanted to watch yeah. the movies. Yeah, because uh, I because I was like thirteen. Exactly, and you were in charge of them. Yes, uh, like like have like having a dog watch your horse. No, uh, no, a horse, a horse watch, watch your, your dog. dog. Yeah, that's what it is. From John Mulaney. Yes. Um, so, uh, what medal are you bestowing upon Anima, like Mons Kanata to Chewbacca? You know, I have. <laughs> Sorry, it's just occasionally I think about the weird things we say during this podcast, right. and uh, I'm like, nobody knows what any of this means no. anymore. No, it's lost all of its meaning. What medal are you giving it? I, I still give this a gold. It's a gold medal? Yeah. Um, I, th- I think I'm giving it a silver. Okay. Um, Just because it's like, I, I think like 90s alternative is not deeply my thing. Right. Um, and this I've listened to like a thousand times. Yeah. Uh, I, I do recognize that it is extremely important and mm-hmm. that all like tool is remarkable to me for how instantaneously recognizable they are. Right. I, I think you could play me like like I haven't really listened to much of anything off of like their other albums. But like I think you could play me just uh, out of the blue. You could play me a song off of one of their albums and I would probably be able to identify it as tool. Uh, not what album it's from or what the name of the song is, but I would probably be able to go like, oh, that's Tool. That's definitely 100%. Tool. 100%. There's no other band that could be. Um, and I also think it's kind of interesting because like listening to this, listening to some of the, like the way that Adam Jones tends to like write guitar riffs mm-hmm. um, and like effects that they use now and then, like, uh, you know, listening to like some other progressive bands that, made albums after this like you can kind of hear how like bands like tool influence like fucking dream theater oh who sure had been around and making progressive metal before uh you know for for years beforehand mm-hmm. uh, uh like since 85 something like that um when they met in college so it's like it's like you, you know despite them you know tool being newcomers to the scene just it's incredible how big their influence is to where like you know there are certain riffs on like metropolis part two mm-hmm. or uh um uh the one that came after that um cannot remember the name of it but anyway the you know like dream theater albums from the late 90s and early 2000s mm-hmm. where it's like oh that that's where this sort of vibe kind of comes from Mm -hmm. is them incorporating like, Oh, this is what other bands are kind of doing in Peru. Let's do some, let's do our take on that. Mm -hmm. Uh, which I don't know. I think that's neat. Right. Well, cause the guys in dream through they're all, they're all, uh, uh, prodigies. Yeah. You know, and they, they know how to, 
learn and grow and and incorporate uh new bits of right. new bits of stuff into their sound mm-hmm. uh uh sometime this summer it'll be dream theater time again uh, all right as as is our tradition of i don't know sometime during the summer we listen to a dream theater album <laughs> uh but uh next week i as i started to say like next week oh it's me I didn't think about it again, so it'll be once again a uh, kale surprise. <laughs> Which, by the way, that is the worst type of pie. <laughs> a kale surprise. <laughs> yeah. A kale pie. What kind of pie is it, Mom? Kale. <laughs> oh. What, like, what else would be in that? You taste it and you tell me what's in it. Ugh. Because a, like a, pie, a pie, you put it in the oven <laughs> yeah, and it's a leafy green vegetable. So it's all going to be wilty and gross. Yeah, I mean, kind of. I could. I've Probably. actually had. I've actually had vegetable pies before. Like a. I guess. Like a spinach pie. You put a nice uh, sort of a cream sauce in there. And I, yeah, I guess it depends on what you put it in there with. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah. So I don't. I don't know what I want to talk about next week. So I'll figure it out. So I, I, I imagine when you. It's a kale pie. Imagine you standing over the corner missing an arm. <laughs> <laughs> you better enjoy it. <laughs> I paid dearly for that pie. <laughs> now I'm thinking of Sweeney Todd. Yeah. Um, but anyhow. Yeah. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, then why don't you go ahead and uh, subscribe to our feed on whatever it is you're using to listen to the episode. If you haven't done so already, uh, you can also follow our pages on Facebook and Twitter, if you just search Bronze Medalist, mm-hmm. just the way it's spelled on the title of the podcast, I'm sure mm-hmm. you will uh, find the correct page um, mm-hmm. if you want to do that. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening to uh, another episode of the Bronze Medalist podja- podcast. Podcast. The podcast. Uh, pod- <laughs> thank you very much for listening to another episode of the Bronze Medalist podcast. I'm Kale. I'm OJ. Congratulations. Congratulations.